Now we're going to look at how you can use multiple prompts to fine tune the ideas and code that you're getting from an LLM, such as ChatGPT or Copilot or really any of them. Often when you're when you're doing this kind of thing, you will get you will give it a prompt and it will generate code for you, and then you can give it subsequent prompts to refine what it's giving you. There's a couple of different approaches here, really. First of all, you sometimes want, you might want to refine your original prompt and rerun it because you may want sort of one prompt to, to rule them all so that you can put that prompt with your code as a comment and not have this flow of uh, uh, conversation that ultimately resulted. You can sometimes even ask the LLM to summarize that flow of conversation and, and basically ask it, what would have been one prompt that I could have given you that would have gotten me to where we are here without having to make all these, these changes? I haven't found them always that effective at being able to roll that all back up, but it's certainly something that you can try. I'm gonna go ahead and run this. This is a notebook that allows you to send these prompts and have it generate code for you, you may very well want to just go to the, the, the playground at platformopenai.com where you can just put in your prompt, you can put in kind of your coding requirements here in the system prompt. But if you want to do it directly through the notebook, which certainly works as well, you start by defining this. So I give it a template, which is effectively my system prompt. The following is a friendly conversation between a human and an AI ge to generate Python code. If you have notes about the code, place them before the code. Any notes about the execution should follow the code. This prevents it from intermixing sometimes its notes about it in, in the middle, uh, which will cause non-compatible code. Uh, do not mix any notes with the code. Add proper comments to the code. Sort imports and follow PEP8 formatting. And there you, you, can, you can see it. And we're going to use GPT-40 Mini. So let's go ahead and run this part. There you have that. And I am going to have it create an XOR approximator for, for me. You don't see this as an example of neural networks as much anymore, but this used to always be a example, you would teach the neural network to from data, and there's only four pieces of data for this. It's the different, the truth table essentially for the XOR. And that will, that will uh, train it to approximate that. So we're gonna say, write Python code to learn the XOR function with PyTorch. So we're gonna use a neural network to learn the XOR function. Now granted, this is massive overkill, but it, it, it is often used as a hello world sort of a example for generating, or for uh, neural networks. So here we can see basically the Python code snippet, import necessary libraries, import PyTorch, all of this. It creates the class forward and, and all this kind of stuff. So sometimes I like to use a sequence rather than a class because this is a very simple neural network. We can basically have it, and it defines it there, but we're gonna say, could you make this a sequence rather than an, an in module class? Now, if you want one prompt to rule them all, that's probably a, an important detail that I, I should have I should have told it. Sometimes it will pick a module class. Sometimes it will pick a sequence. For simple, straightforward neural networks like this one, I really do prefer the sequence. This also illustrates another point that you'll see when you're using large language models to generate code for you. They will sometimes vary style. So I've, I've noticed that I will be doing some computer vision sort of stuff, and it will be using pill for a bit to do the images. Then all of a sudden, uh, for no apparent reason, new modules, it'll start doing OpenCV. 
And I really like OpenCV, so that's the one that I would typically have it use. So you, you need to really specify the primary libraries that it should be using. Otherwise, you're going to end up potentially with every library under the sun to do something. It, for data processing, it, it will tend to use pandas for most things, but I could certainly see it as it becomes more aware of other things like polars, possibly switching off to them. The computer vision libraries, it does tend to, to switch quite a bit. So here I requested this change, and you can see now it's a sequence, and there is no class, which is good, which is what I was asking it to do. We can test the generated code. So basically I just took that code there, pasted it into a new cell, and I can run it. And you will see this, this is a typical problem with exclusive or approximators. You can see that it, it, it basically gave me these predicted values, but they are, they're not right. This is because it's such a small neural network, you're extremely sensitive to the initial random weights. And basically what I can then do is, and this gets into what we talk a little bit more in the next one, is debugging, you can tell it, hmm, I don't think your output was correct. Because if we look at this, you can see that I basically tell it, are you sure this is correct? And then it says something that it appears that the model has not learned it effectively. And it suggests some things to go about remedying that. And usually it is kind enough to actually take its own advice and it makes some changes. We can then test this improved. So it has more epochs. It, what does it all do? It increases the number of epochs, adjusts the learning rate, adds more neurons in the hidden layer, uh, a different optimizer. Usually what you need to do with XOR is just realize, okay, if I've done 100 epochs and it's still not converging, I need to just reinitialize the weights. But it sort of gets that effect by just adding more weights. So here's the improved version. And we can see, yeah, the loss quickly, quickly hits scientific notation and we can see that the results are good. You'll, you can see really though that the, the, the scientific notation here is much smaller for, for this one and this one, which are the zeros, and these are much closer to, to the ones. The scientific notation, if you're not used to looking at it, might make it look like this didn't work as well, but these two are very close to one. These, the top and bottom are very close to zero, which matches what we would want. And then I do what I said before. I said, okay, okay, this is great. Can you suggest a single prompt that would have resulted in the last code output? It basically gives you this, which would probably get you closer. Usually what I try to do is craft that prompt somewhat on my own. I've not found that this always works necessarily the best. And then it gives you the code again. And then we test that final prompt that it gave us that was supposed to result. And you can see, if you notice this, this, is, this, is, this can be annoying when you're dealing with large language models to generate your code. See how the epoch, see how the output changed? Look what the output is there. And then the output up here is different. It's going with a totally different format. So that is, again, why you have to really, you, you'd probably even one-shot it, provide an example, so to speak, and give it some example of what you want the output to look like. So you've got to tell this thing really everything, or it is going to vary. I notice this a lot with image generation. Like if I have it generate something, and I don't know, generates a nice house on the hill, some trees, and I tell it, oh, that is great. Just put a little brook in front of it, a little river, and the whole image will shift. There'll, 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 be, an, uh, there'll be a river, but it's now, um, it's now with a completely different, different house. And there's the final output. 
from the prompt that it gave us. So the, the prompt did accomplish really what I said, but it is, it is changing the output. And just like if you hire a human contractor, if you don't necessarily specify what the output is, it's, they're, they're going to pick their own. But you would hope that they would at least stay consistent. So this is, this is one of the things that you certainly have to manage when you're using large language models like this. Thank you for watching the video and please subscribe to the channel if, so that you can watch all my AI projects and keep up with this class. Thank you for watching.